I can't believe we're celebrating five years since we, since the Lord instilled fresh vision in us for this church. Five years. And we get to celebrate next Sunday. So make sure you invite somebody. And I know Miguel was telling everybody we're going to have carne asada and whatnot. He had to retract that statement. You know, we'll have carne asada afterwards, bro. Come on. <laughs> At his house. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm thankful for how the Holy Spirit of God continues to move in this place. I just want to jump right into prayer. And I just want everyone just to bow their heads. Father, thank you, Lord. Teach us your ways and let us forsake ours, Lord. We release everything to you right now for your glory. We exchange pride and a self-seeking attitude for one that is humble to receive your word and ready to serve you. We operate in kingdom pursuit, declaring I will forsake everything for the king. Give us the ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say in these moments, oh God. And may our cry be forever, I trust you, Jesus. Whatever you say, I will do. Whatever you say, I will do. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Today I'll be closing out my sermon series title. It's not political, it's spiritual. And my objective for this particular message is to instill in us an understanding that everything that is happening around us in our world must be viewed through a spiritual lens. It is very easy to view things through our flesh. It's very easy to view things through whatever the mainstream media throws our way. But it's very important for us, especially in the season that we're in, that we continuously seek the Holy Spirit of God and allow him to show us and to see things the way Jesus sees things. To embrace the things he embraces and to reject the things he rejects. So that we continuously walk in line with whatever it is the Holy Spirit of God has for us. Amen. I'm grateful for the message that Pastor Monty and Pastor Kelly delivered to us last Sunday. How many were here for that? Praise the Lord. Come on. And the great news that the king has an appointment with you. That's, that's huge. For some people that was the first time you probably ever heard that the, that the king of kings, that the Lord of lords has an appointment with you. And not only does he have an appointment with you, but he has a special anointing for you so that you can fulfill the task in which he has called you to complete. And the realization, I love how the end of the message, how we just tied it in together to stop hesitating. How many of us know that we can be really good hesitators? We can be really good procrastinators. Come on. Oh, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. Huh? But the Lord is saying the time is now, especially in the context of our culture and our climate. Things are drastically changing extremely, extremely fast. And if the church is not ready to embrace what it is that's happening so that we can truly remove the things that don't belong and accept the things that do belong, we're going to be caught up in a whirlwind and we're not even going to know where we're at. Because the devil, all he desires for us to instill confusion in us and to con continuously deceive us. And so my message for today is titled, It's Time for Action. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell him it's time. I want you to look at your other neighbor and tell him for action. Come on, it's time for action. Let's go. We thank the king of kings and we serve one king and we serve one kingdom. We serve one king and we serve one kingdom. Let's say that all together. One king, one kingdom. Again, one king, one kingdom. And it's very important for us to understand this because it then it, it, it begins to break down the truth that his authority and reign is not limited to a specific area or a specific arena. But the truth of God's word must be injected in every arena, including government, business, and schools. Amen? And that's the whole uh, objective of this. It's not political. It's spiritual. Because we have been deceived. The church has been deceived and, and, and trained to believe that God can only remain and live within the confines of a, of a building. 
When the actuality is, is that God has given us believers power from on high, bestowed upon us, gave us the Holy Spirit. Spirit to go out and to make waves and to cause waves and to create drastic change throughout the culture and the society in which God has called us to have influence. Can I get an amen? amen. And so today I have a special guest. His name is Mike Cruz. Um, and I got to meet this guy a few years back. The Lord pressed it on me to, to have him come up and share a little bit about some of the stuff that me and him conversated about, some of the things that the Lord has been stirring in his heart, but we met about three years ago. One thing that I really, really admired about Mike when I first met him was his boldness. So when we first met about, it might have been about three years ago, huh? The elementary school district was uh, attempting to uh, introduce curriculum into the elementary school district that included, let's just say it what it is, a lot of sexual perversion. And so this brother began to ring the bell on that nonsense. He began to ring the bell and we began to uh, bring together pastors and leaders and, 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 and leaders from the community. And we got together and we got to learn a little bit about what was happening. And we got to then unite and stand firm against that nonsense. And can I tell you right now, they never passed it. And so I'm blessed by this man who is a native to Arizona. Right, he's been here. He holds his bachelor's degree. Just a little bit about his background. He holds a bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies from the Arizona State University and has his MBA. He's a senior manager of state public policy for the American Automotive Manufacturing Company here and serves as the chief lobbyist representing the organization across the United States. And uh, previously, Mike served as the county administrator to Pinal County District 3. Uh, during his time there, he was instrumental in shaping favorable policy and economic development for the county. And then moreover, he drastically improved their community relationship efforts and spearheaded key public-private partnerships that provided residents with access to enhanced services that were not previously provided. He's a firm believer in quality education. Thankful for that, brother. And community service. And Mike has dedicated his life to these causes He's currently the governing board member with the Castle Grand Elementary School District. We're super proud of you on that. I remember the day you got voted in, brother. And it, 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 part of the community as an, in the elected capacity. In addition, he is the president of the board of directors for the United Way of Pinal County. Uh, he's an active board member for the Salvation Army here in Castle Grand. Uh, Mike also represents the Arizona business community on the Arizona Education Economic Commission. And is a board member for the Arizona Manufacturing Council and Pinal County Workforce Development Board. He lives right here in CG. Come on. With his beautiful wife, Felicia. And when he's not working or serving, you'll find him active here at Passion Church, which he calls home. We're thankful for that. He loves to travel, golf, and stay up with current financial news and politics. Mike Cruz, brother. I want to thank you for willing to share and impart on us some wisdom. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, Passion Church. I'm very thankful to be afforded the opportunity to stand before my favorite church and also my favorite service. I'm an um, attendee of the 11 o'clock service. because that, Yeah. That, that 9 o'clock service is a different crowd, let me tell you. Um, I happily serve with my wife, Felicia. You've probably seen me out there at the Passion Kids booth doing registration. That's right now. Um, but I'm walking through here and people are like, man, you look familiar. And you'd be surprised what a suit could do. I'm usually in hula shirts and shorts, so mixed a lot of people up today. But um, we're talking about a very important topic, and I'm very blessed to be here and be called to be able to deliver this message. As the pa pastor mentioned, I do serve and represent your voice on the Cascade Elementary School District Governing Board. It is an elected role, and I take it seriously. Our children are our future, and we need to ensure that we're providing the right resources and the right messaging to ensure our children have the opportunities that we want them to have so that they have a successful future, not just in school, but in the workplace and beyond. As part of my job, um, the, the pastor mentioned I'm a lobbyist, so a lot of times when I'm out and about, people are asking, hey, they, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a lobbyist. And they're like, two responses. One is, what's a lobbyist? And two, it's either they're like, 
disappointed or want to throw something at me. So it depends on where you stand in the aisle. But the reality is when I talk to people about lobbying, really, I'm in a position of education and information. I'm like a teacher, but instead of students, I'm working with elected officials and policymakers that create and design policy that we implement in our society. And as part of that, the pastor talked about him just taking charge and us taking the initiative to get involved. He talks about just bringing up a chair and sitting down and joining the conversation at the table. That's sort of what I do for a on a daily basis. And as part of that, I have the opportunity to meet with a lot of people from City Hall all the way to the White House. I've met with so many elected officials from congressmen and women, governors, presidents, and it's, it's a unique opportunity to be in a, at the table in a position to share God's word and to be able to ensure we're doing what's right. And that is making sure God's word is relevant and present across the board in every boardroom, in every business, school, and government. And <laughs> amen. And part of what I'm here to do today is I want to take these few minutes, and I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, what to vote for. I'm not here to tell you that. What I'm here to tell you is to share my experience, to help guide you to be spiritual in a political world and what it takes to do so. And part of that, there's some spiritual items that I want to bring to your attention that we need to focus on. And as you leave these church doors, I encourage you to look into it. Happening outside these church doors today are big issues impacting policies that strictly defy God's word. Number one is Title IX. And this is federal policy that impacts regulation in schools. And it refers to sexual discrimination. But what they've done is they've taken a 50-year policy to change biological sex to gender identity. And why is that important? That's important because it impacts our children and it opens up the door for children that are biological males that identify as females could play in female sports, utilize female facilities on overnight trips, stay in female rooms, and vice versa. This is a serious problem, and we need to take ownership, and I encourage you to look into that. I'm going to a conference next week uh, to learn more, um, to make sure that type of information and policy does not impact our children here, because God doesn't make mistakes, and we need to make sure we represent that. Lastly, Prop 139, it's an abortion bill. Um, it's an initiative, the Right to Abort Initiative, and this is part of a voter initiative, which you'll vote on November 5th, that basically, um, negates the current law. Right now, it's illegal to abort a child after 15 weeks. This initiative takes that away, and it's masquerading as a woman's right and to protect her health and choice. And the reality is, again, God doesn't make mistakes. Every child is precious, and we need to protect life. I encourage you to read about it. $23 million has been invested in that campaign. Guess how much has been invested to oppose it and to represent God's word? Only $800,000. So there's money and people and media behind this. And the reality, that's how it occurs. But how we got here, why are we taking this position? Why are we using this time now to take action? Well, we've been asleep at the wheel. We really have. And I see it all the time, but there's only one of me. But there's all of us with an opportunity to unite and real quick, just to give you some perspective, if you're over the age of 18 and registered to vote, I want you to stand up real quick. If you're over 18, registered to vote, stand up real quick for me. It's okay, we'll be honest, there's no need. Okay, of you that are over the age of 18 and registered to vote, I want you, if you did not vote this last July, if you did not vote in the primary, sit down. If you did not vote, You see that? That's Christian voices not being represented. In. And this is not a bash at us. This is the facts. This is the data. As of the last Pinal County uh, canvassing, 28.9% of Pinal County voters that are registered to vote, mind you, there's over 300,000 voters, only 28.9% voted. We have a strong voice 
It's time to use it, everyone. And that's why I'm here today is because we need to be able to realize we're here because we fell asleep. It's time to wake up, Passion Church. It's time to call your friends, call your neighbors, and tell them God is on the ballot and that we need to represent his voice. How does it happen? What is his voice? What should you say? In my time in politics, it takes seven contacts to be able to sway a voter. That means I need you to make seven text messages, seven phone calls to your friends, your family, your neighbors, and tell them what's at stake. It's God's word. Doing what's right. If we want a Christian nation, we need to have a Christian government. And in order for us to have a Christian government, we need Christian leaders getting elected. And it starts with each and every single one of us to do so. So get out there and make sure you're making those contacts, reaching out. And when they ask, why should we? Why do we need to do this as Christians? Because God tells us to. In 1 John 3.18, it states, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in action and in truth. Action. We already have the truth. The truth is right here. God needs us to take action. And that's why I'm here. That's why we're here. How do we take action, everyone? It starts by registering to vote. If you're already registered, it means getting up, getting to the ballot box and voting on November 5th or voting early. Ballots drop 30 days before the election. But more importantly, just don't go out there and cast a blind vote. Get out there and cast a vote that truly captures God's word and the Christian voice. Be informed. Research. Look into the candidates. Go to Pinal.gov. See the candidates who are running. Go to the state secretary uh, website. Learn. Research. Understand who's out there representing the voice of all of us. It's important. And when you get there on election day, you know where that vote is going. And that vote is to uphold God's word in that person because their moral characters and spiritual guidance is going to do what's right to make us a Christian nation. So make sure you get out and vote. If you can, donate to your friends that are running for office. It's not cheap. It's hard work. $5, $10, whatever you could do. Contribute to their campaign. It makes a difference. I close with this. The time is now, everyone. I've seen too many times where the Christian voice, God's word, is not being represented. It's time for us to show the world as a church united what we can do. Imagine a world of all of God's children upholding God's word. Man, what a beautiful world that is. That's the closest to heaven we're going to get. But until then, we need to come lead with love, lead by example. So when we're out there and people say, why should we vote for this person? They shouldn't even ask that because when they see you, they recognize that is a good person. If they trust this person, I trust that person. Lead by example. And lastly, get involved. God has given us each and every single one of us beautiful talents. Use those talents for good. Whether it's talking to people, running a website, helping with accounting, Get involved. Help people that are running for these offices. Get involved to support them. Use God's talents and gifts to make a difference. So for all my brothers and sisters here at Passion Church right now standing before me, and for all of the brothers and sisters on our online campus, I encourage you. If there's nothing you do or don't do at all, I just encourage you to get out and vote. And to do so, it's simple, it's easy, it's free. All you got to do is right now, if you haven't voted or haven't registered to vote, text VOTE to 42589. If you haven't registered to vote and over the age of 18 and a U.S. citizen, text VOTE to 42589. By doing that simple gesture and getting registered to vote, God's word is on the ballot. God's children needs to show up. So let's show up together, ladies and gentlemen. Let's make a difference. Let's get out there and vote. With God first, until then, guys, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. I encourage all of you, if you have questions, find me afterwards. But get out there and vote, represent the voice of God, and let's do this together. Thank you very much for your time. I sincerely appreciate it.
Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate that. And when the Lord stirred me to have him come up and share a few things, I knew he was going to offer insight for us uh, that I would not be able to provide for you. So I'm truly thankful for where God has placed you, Mike, for the work that you're doing, and that you are going to be that person that's going to ring the bell when the demonic starts trying to come in and infiltrate in the things that, to try to sway people away from who Jesus is. So we're truly thankful for you, Mike. I do want to just recognize a couple people uh, as well here that are running, people that are part of our church that are running for um, uh, four offices, elected uh, officials here uh, in Castle Grants. We have Bruce Shute. For those who know Bruce Shute, he's running for uh, the elementary school board. And so when you see his name on the ballot, come on, right? We have Yvonne Sai as well here. She, there she is. She was at the 9 o'clock service as well. She's running for the high school board. And these are individuals that are going to carry... The, 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 the voice of the Lord into those rooms, and when they see something that does not belong, trust me, they're going to ring the bell, and they're going to wake everybody up and say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. I'm truly thankful for these two. Part of our church here at Passion Church, who are willing to say, you know what, it's not easy. I've talked, had several conversations with Bruce. It's not easy, but he's out there. He's doing it, getting the signatures, everything that, that, it, that entails to, to run for office, but they're doing it. So I'm truly, truly honored and proud of both of you for doing that. Thank you. Jeremiah, the Lord has had me in the book of Jeremiah for a while. Jeremiah was a prophet of the Old Testament who God raised up during a very turbulent time, very chaotic time. Evil was running rampant. The king was evil. The leaders were evil. Everything that was being done in that time was all Baal worship, idol worship, sexual perversion. It was just the normal in that culture. And here comes Jeremiah. The Lord has called him to raise up and, hey, I need you to be a voice in the midst of this chaos and in the midst of all these demonic components that are happening. I need you to rise up and encourage the people to repent and to turn back to God. Jeremiah was a man who wanted and desired to deliver this message of warning, but also a, a, a message of hope to the people of Judah. And I want to read to you Jeremiah chapter 1, 4, th uh, 4 through 10. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That word consecrate means to be set apart for a purpose. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, oh, Lord God, behold, this is Jeremiah, I do not know how to speak for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Man, talk about a massive mandate that was placed on Jeremiah the prophet. Man, God speaks to him. Just how he speaks to us today. Can I tell you, the Lord is speaking to his people today. The thing is, is are we aware of the voice of God? Are we keen to the, to the voice of the Holy Spirit so we are prompted and moved as he speaks? He told Jeremiah, man, before I even, before, telling him that before he was born, God has given him purpose. God has chosen Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations. This means he was set apart for a special job from the very start of his life. And can I tell you right now, church, you too have been selected with a divine mandate from heaven. Come on. A divine mandate from heaven to do God's will here on this earth. And there are demonic forces that work over time to prevent you from stepping into the full calling that God has for your life. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it's a little scary. Jeremiah responded with expressing doubt and fear and says, man, I, I'm too young. I'm, I'm inexperienced. You know, how am I going to speak on behalf of you, O oh Lord? 
Ultimately saying, I don't even know how to speak well. Come on, how many of us have been caught in those moments like, man, I, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know how to say it. I, I don't even know how to approach this situation. Lord. What am I supposed to do? But the Lord revealed to Jeremiah that he is the one doing the work. He is the one speaking through him. And when we, in, when we position ourselves in that place and say, Lord, I'm just going to be obedient to whatever you have to say because I know when I do, you show up. Every time I walk in obedience, every time I say yes to you, Lord Jesus, you show up. And he shows up every single time. Why? Because at the end of the day, it will never be you receiving glory. It will always be glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because when that move happens, when that miracle happens, we can look up to heaven and say, Jesus, if it wasn't for you, oh my goodness. That would have been a disaster. Come on. I'm preaching to somebody in this place. God continuously reassures Jeremiah. Tell him, don't worry. Don't worry about your age. Don't worry about your ability. God promises to send him to deliver messages that, and that he must go wherever God sends him. God tells Jeremiah not to be afraid of people. Even in those moments, leaders, kings operating in the demonic, he told him, don't be afraid. I'm blessed to individuals like Mike who rise up and, 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 and walk into these rooms, right, where, where, where we're told, like, hey, these people are way over here and you're way down here. You, you, don't, you don't belong in those spaces. And I just see Mike. I haven't seen you walk into one of those rooms, but I can picture in my head you walk in the, into that room like you own that room. And I'm not necessarily here because I was invited. I'm here because God has ordained me to be here in this moment. And if God ordained me to be here in that moment, then I'm going to walk in and declare the truth of God's word, carrying as a light bearer the bright light of Christ in every sphere. Amen. God symbolically touches Jeremiah's mouth, giving him the words to say. And this act shows that God will provide Jeremiah with the right message and the ability to speak them. Can I tell you right now, church, even in the midst of this particular series that God has called me to, it's not political, it's spiritual. Let me tell you, there was moments when I said, Lord, there's about a hundred other messages I could pull out of this scripture. Come on, can you give me something different? Can you give me something different? He says, no, you will speak what I tell you to speak. I said, okay, Lord. And so here we are, preaching a message to all this, not political, it's spiritual. Why? Because the moment that we are in, the culture that we are in right now demands a voice to rise up and say, hey, that is wrong, that is right. We need to stand firm and expose darkness and expose evil and not be afraid to make room at the table. Even though we're not invited, I'm just going to roll up. Why? Because you have been mandated by God. You have been given an appointment by God to declare his truth and his word and wherever it is that the Lord sends you, he is with you and we find comfort and peace and joy knowing that he is with us everywhere we go. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on. I love at the end of that, I love at the end of that where God outlines Jeremiah's mission. He tells him straight out to uproot and to tear down. Come on, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This means that he will deliver messages that both warn of coming destruction and also at the same time offer hope for renewal and rebuilding. If you've been coming to this church long enough, you know that when I come upon this pulpit, sometimes we're tearing down, sometimes we're plucking up, but then there's other times where we're building and there's other times that we're planting and you're not going to come into this place and just receive grace, 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 grace. No, you're going to come into this place, you're going to receive some truth and you're going to receive some correction. You're going to receive some understanding. Why? Because as a pastor, I have been mandated to shepherd you in that capacity so that when you are outside of these four walls and the demonic forces, all hell breaks loose against you. When all hell breaks loose against you, you will be able to stand firm on the promises of God and you will not be shaken. Can I tell you, church, right now, you will not be shaken. So let me tell you, you have also been mandated to pluck up and to tear down. You have been mandated to, to rip out. You have been mandated to build. You have been mandated to plant. It's not always going to be pretty. Oh, but it's always going to be worth it. When we do what it is that God is calling us to do. See, the culture today, the culture today is defiant towards God. It's ever increasing. 
This massive defiance towards God. And we read in Jeremiah chapter 7, 9 through 11. This is where Jeremiah, in this, in this particular chapter, God calls him to the temple and begins to preach to these people. He says, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and, and go after other gods that you have not known, and, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered? Only to go out doing all these abominations has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. And we read that particular scripture there where it says it becomes a den of robbers. Jesus Christ himself uh, uh, recites that piece of scripture in the Gospels. It's this understanding that, it, that a lot of churches in our culture, in our society, in this world, they, they come on Sunday and, and they love Jesus and they, and they claim to believe in him. But every other day they're caught up in abominations because they don't understand the holiness of God. And let me tell you, I'm not talking about this church. Come on, throw that in there. I'm talking about churches across this globe that has adopted demonic agendas in the name of Jesus. They come before him on a Sunday and begin to praise him and worship him and believe doctrines that do not align to scriptures. But yet they go out and they live out a life that is completely unholy, completely unrighteous. And no wonder that we cannot distinguish between one candidate that is for the demonic agenda and the candidate who is not. Because we ourselves don't understand that which is holy and that which is unholy. We ourselves don't understand that which is righteous and that which is unrighteous. Because so many pulpits in our country are so fearful. So many pastors and leaders are so fearful of losing members in their congregation. They will rather just preach grace, 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 love, love, love. Tickle your ear, tickle your ear, tickle your ear all day long. And the people love it. They swarm in. Oh, yes, it made me feel so good on a Sunday. They made me feel, if you don't come to church and feel like bad every once in a while, I ain't doing it right. Come on, sometimes I come up here and I preach on a Sunday and I leave feeling a little bad. And if I got to leave here feeling a little bad every once in a while, then you're going to leave here feeling a little bad every once in a while. Come on, because the power of the Holy Spirit convicts us. It's not a one-time act. It's not one time and, oh, praise the Lord, I'm done. Still signed, sealed, and delivered. Let's go. I don't have to do nothing else anymore. No, it's the, the, the process of sanctification. The word sanctification means to be set apart. That process of setting apart, it is that very thing, a process. And one year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road, God is going to reveal something in you that you never thought was in you. And then God wants to do some surgery and begin to take that out. Why? Because in our culture, in our society, and where we're living at right now demands a people that understand the holiness of God. Because when you understand the holiness of God, oh, you'll be able to see unholiness from a mile away. And once you start noticing that, you start rebuking that right now in the name of Jesus. You're not even going to come close to me with that nonsense. Especially here, in, uh, Mike here talking about uh, uh, Title IX and, and Proposition 139. Those are demonic agendas that are being placed on the ballot you have to understand it's not about freedoms it's not about none of that the media does a very good job of packaging these things and people just eat it up they just eat it up it has nothing to do with that it's coming against at the end of the day the agenda the demonic i need you to hear me the the demonic agenda behind these things is to come against the church period you imagine from a federal mandate, Title IX is accepted and adopted and it becomes law of the land. What is that? What, uh, what is the first group of people they're going to come against? What's the first group of people they're going to come against? The Christian. They're going to come against the church. And they're going to come into your church and they say, it's the law. Those restrooms have to be open. So if a, a man says he's a girl, can go into the girl's restroom. That's what Title IX is. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar. These are the things that are happening right now in our culture. It is demonic, just like in Jeremiah's time. That's why God called Jeremiah to rise up and declare some truth in that space. And they hated him. Oh, they hated him. But we're not in it for the love of people. We're in it for the love of God. And this mindset in the church has to be broken. And sometimes we come in and we think we are good knowing of Jesus instead of obeying Jesus. 
I'm going to say that one more time. We think we are good knowing of Jesus instead of obeying Jesus. Can I tell you, church, there's a difference. Even the demonic realm believes Jesus. They don't obey Jesus. There's a difference. We operate outside of his will. It become, we become so desensitized to walking in the will of God in our culture that we have accepted it and become okay with it. As long as I praise, praise Jesus on a Sunday, oh, love Jesus on a Sunday, who cares what I do on a Monday? And that mindset has been adopted by so many people in our culture, and that's why we are where we're, where we're at. Some people believe that we know more than God. Oh, that's a lot of people, especially the government. Let me give you the skinny on this real quick. There's an agenda, liberal viewpoints, leftist viewpoints, that want to replace God with government. Straight up. They're the ones that's going to tell you what's good and what's not. They're the ones that are going to tell you what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. This will not be relevant. It's whatever they decide, and that's what they're going to move forward with. And we see that with Proposition 139, which will be on the ballot November 5th, and we see that with Title IX. They're coming in and saying, we know best. We know best. And that is a dangerous place to be. Many claim to follow God and understand his love, yet we live in ways that are completely in opposition to the standard of his word and his purpose for our lives. And the scripture makes it very clear in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all, with all your mind and with all your strength. It's, it's a desire, a deep desire that gets stirred and you're not going to figure it out on your own. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's going to teach you how to run after Jesus, to pursue him daily, to love on him daily, to get to know him daily. It doesn't come easy. It's not, it's not, in, it's not inside of us. It's not automatic. We have to train ourselves to break off that fleshly desire and begin to operate in the spirit. Four weeks ago, the Lord told me, you're going to start praising me and you're going to seek me in prayer running before church on Sunday. I said, what? Like go running like before church? <laughs> I'm probably going to be a little tired and whatnot. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying to sleep in to like the very, you know what I mean? I got to get up and go to church to give me the insight. And I remember that, that day he told me, this is the day you're going to do it. It was about four Sundays ago. T today was my fourth Sunday. That I get up in the morning, early in the morning, I go running. And I pursue him and I worship him. And I remember that Sunday, I'm sitting there looking at the alarm. I don't want to get up. No, you do it next week. No, you do it next week. No, no get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. No, I don't want to get up. I don't want to get up. Do it next week. This is the battle. This is real, guys. And I know if I go through it, you're going through it. But that moment to say that my desire, Lord, is to obey you. Amen. And so now on Sunday mornings, I get up and I go running and I pray and I worship. And I speak in tongues and I'm loud and I'm in the desert. And I don't even know if there's maybe there's houses out there that hear me. I don't know if they hear me. If they don't hear me, I don't care. I'm just running. And the Lord downloads things in me. The Lord downloads things in me. And I get to come to my wife and say, hey, this is what the Lord showed me. And he shows me these pictures. And I take pictures of the sky. He's just glorious, majestic. It's just amazing. And it's beautiful. But when we operate in this heart and this mindset, this Lord, I, I just don't want to know of you. I want to know you. I want to obey you. Then, man, everything changes. Everything changes. We begin to live out this verse. It's Jesus when he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. It's in those moments that we can truly do the will of God it's very hard to follow and obey a God that you do not even love it's hard to obey Jesus when you barely trust him and so it's required in these moments we have to step out of defiance and embrace the call 
We have to step out of defiance and embrace the call. Let me give you a declaration in this moment. The Lord has revealed in this particular pieces of scripture that I have set you this day over nations and kingdoms. I want that just to marinate for a moment. I have set you this day over nations and kingdoms. And I hear the word of the Lord just flood me. God told Jeremiah, I put you over nations and kingdoms. And I began to meditate on the immense authority and responsibility bestowed upon him. It means that Jeremiah's message will have a major impact influencing entire regions. Influencing leaders. His role is not limited to his own, his own small sphere, but extends to broader realms. This is the mission God entrusted him with delivering his message that can shape the landscape of nations and their people. Bruce, when you run for that, that office, you walk in there like the Lord has placed you over nations and over kingdoms. When you get elected and you're in that place, you talk and you carry yourself like God has placed you over kingdoms and over nations because the Lord Almighty is with you. My sister Yvonne, when you walk into that high school board, oh, new elected official, they're going to try to intimidate you. They're going to try to let you know that you're new and your voice doesn't count yet. you got to put your time in. There is no time. God has accelerated you. God has accelerated you. And you walk into that room like you've been in there for the past 20 years. And you carry the light of Jesus in that place. You have immense authority in this world. We just don't operate in it. We serve the king of kings and he has given us his spirit to take over territories for his kingdom. And let me tell you something right now, church. No territory is off limits. If anybody ever comes and tells you that God is not allowed in this space, they've lied to you. You better be like, hey, you, you, you must not know my king. Like he owns everything. He owns the White House. Oh, come on. Oh, some people got, some people were convinced that he didn't own the White House. He owns the White House. And everything inside of it. It's time for action. That's what it boils down to. It's time for action. And this is for the believers in the house and those watching online. I want you to hear me. I want to I pass you for just a moment. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit of God just to allow these words to resonate in you. Because some of you might be in this space. Some of you might be watching online and say, wow, politics has no place in the church. I know that's what you've been taught, but you've been lied to. Because to say that politics don't belong in the church is to say Jesus doesn't belong in politics. And if we say Jesus doesn't belong in politics, then we limit his kingdom and we limit his authority. How dare we? We have no right and no authority to limit the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We can no longer stay silent on important matters in our country. We can't. That time is over. We can no longer live with our heads in the sand pretending we are not in an active spiritual war. We can no longer support candidates, political parties, or any other groups that openly support, promote, and advocate for demonic agendas like abortion, sexual perversion, and the destruction of our youth through evil indoctrination, leading them away from Jesus. We must call them out and expose evil unapologetically. Let me tell you something. To love is to speak the truth. To love is to speak the truth. And we must separate ourselves and call that which is evil, evil. Mm. And call that which is good, good. God is calling us to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And it's interesting how those six components, four of them are destructive. 
four out of the six. To break down, to destroy, to pluck up and to overthrow, but also to plant and to build. So like Mike said, this is not a moment to sway anybody. When I don't want that responsibility. I want you to come before the Lord Almighty in prayer and ask Him. And can I let you know you can ask Him directly? You can ask Him directly. You can, you can literally get on your knees and say, Lord, tell me who to vote for. And if you seek Him earnestly, He will reveal it to you. And when He does, you need to move on it. Heavenly Father, we thank you thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. We thank you that you reveal so much that you allow us to talk about the hard things in this place. That you remind us of the authority and the power that you have given us. Today is a Kingdom Builder Sunday, and so the first Sunday of the month, we just take a quick moment to talk about Kingdom Builders and such an amazing initiative that God has allowed us to birth here at Passion Church to uh, support global ministry efforts, local ministry efforts, and also preparing us for campus expansion and, and uh, establishing new locations. And so what I want you to do is I don't want you to do nothing right now. I, what I want you to do is just take one of these cards. Uh, and then I also, uh, if you would like to have a digital version, you can text KB to 42589. But I want you to pray. I want you to go home and pray. It's very interesting how Mike mentioned that even with Proposition 139, that those that are trying to make that law, these people, these, these people, <laughs> evil people, can come together and rally and bring in 28 million to support that bill. But yet when it comes to opposing a bill like that, they're only able to raise 800,000. So it's gonna, Kingdom Builders trains us, trains us to live generously. It trains us to understand that the issue at hand is bigger than than just myself and so I want you to pray and I want you to ask the Lord what it looks like for you to be a kingdom builder in November we do our miracle offering weekend which is a big deal uh, which will give you an opportunity if you in that moment just a place before the altar a dollar amount that you wanted to pour in as we begin to mobilize and uh, support our uh, our mission uh, initiatives around the world locally and expanding the church and we're a church that practices the biblical principle of tithing we believe that God is a generous God and he is teaching us how to have his heart and to walk in generosity and so for those that understand that and realize that everything that you have has been given to you by God uh, we also take a tithe uh, which simply means 10% of the increase that he has given us and we return it to him in the form of a tithe to his house and so once a month we actually pass our giving containers and so today is that month so if I can have my host come up and so for kingdom builders again I want you to pray see what that looks like for you 
uh, for those uh, that came prepared with your tithe or if you have an offering, uh, we'll have those giving containers uh, passed here in just a moment. But let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that you provide all things. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to trust you with the little that we have so that you can trust us with true riches of heaven. That it is your heart, Lord, to bestow upon us even more. But Lord, your heart even above that is to teach us to steward the things we have now and to steward them well. So Lord, receive these tithes and these offerings. And I pray for those that are praying on kingdom builders, Lord. I pray that you will stir them and that they will do what it is that you're telling them to do for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As the giving containers are being passed, uh, yesterday I got to spend time with Gary Lindbergh and uh, Pastor Moises from Cuba. Uh, this man came down and got to share his heart uh, in regards to what the Lord is doing there in Cuba with building churches. And we've been part of that ministry for the past uh, several years now, quite a few years. Uh, actually, when Pastor Jerry was here, he was, was supporting them. So I want you to know that you're building churches in Cuba. <laughs> A nation that is so oppressed, a nation that has very little resources, a communist nation, and the Spirit of God still moves mightily through that place. As believers like you and me say, you know what, yes, yes, I'll be a kingdom builder. And the part that really stuck with me with Pastor Moises and the story that he was sharing he says, yes, you know, that we, we, we buy these little, and they're not, don't think of churches like our church. <laughs> so if that popped in your mind, cast that out. It's, it's a little, tiny little space. Okay. And he goes, he says, even though we build churches and we do all these things, he says, the part that I really like is how much you guys care about the little things. There, everybody's poor. You can't go and just buy a piece of candy for your kid. Okay, so he says, how much I appreciate that you also provide bags of candy. So when these churches, like how we have Passion Kids, and they're living it up over there in luxury, come on. When they have their events, and they just give one little hard piece of candy to a little girl and a little boy, it blows them away. The impact in that moment. Because it's not something they have, have access to. He says, so I'm thankful for the bags of candy that you guys bring to us so that we can bless the little kids. You are part of that here at Passion Church. And so like I said, the first Sunday of every month, we talk about Kingdom Builders and our Miracle Offering weekend will be in November. And you'll get some more details about that as the day uh, draws near. So I want us to stand up. We're going to close out with our benediction. I'm also going to have our altar ministry team. If I can have uh, you just set up on this side. After I dismiss, if there's anybody here that needs prayer, specific prayer, I don't want you to leave without receiving prayer. And so uh, my altar ministry team will be here to pray for you. For those that are here for the first time, we close out with this benediction. And all it does is to cultivate unity among us so that we're all on the same page. And so we're going to read this together on the count of three. One, two, three. It's all about kingdom pursuit, forsaking everything for the king. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise in this place. We are truly thankful. God bless you. You are dismissed. If you need prayer, please make your way up to the altar. We'll have altar workers here ready to pray for you.